のジャックジェイドアッシュはい。Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin is a collab game from Square Enix and Koei Tecmo's Team Ninja. The game was announced just under a year ago and has gone through an, uh, let's just say, interesting path to release. After that first trailer dropped, Jack Garland, aka Chaos Man, quickly became the Twitter protagonist of the day, and there was no shortage of people roasting on this game for everything from the writing to calling the visuals PS3 quality to people saying, quote, this game proves Square Enix is dead, end quote. This definitely wasn't helped by the fact that the demo they put out for people to play was unironically unplayably broken for days. I distinctly remember searching it up on YouTube right after the trailer dropped, and the first video that came up was a stream from a small Japanese VTuber titled World First FF Origin Demo. The whole stream was just him slowly going hollow as he re downloaded the game multiple times, realizing it just wasn't gonna start no matter what. Pouring one out for you, homie. Yeah, not the best first impression. Then, when the demo did get fixed, it wasn't great. It was janky, the combat felt unpolished, the visuals were dark and muddy, and worst of all, it ran really poorly. But, 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 the final boss of the demo, Garland, showcased the game's systems all working at their best, and legitimately was a great boss fight, and that gave me hope enough to not write off the game just yet. Also, if you're familiar, this is pretty much the same thing Neo went through. Its original alphas were pretty rough, but I think the finished product speaks for itself. Team Ninja has a pretty big library of games, but I think Stranger of Paradise is most similar to Neo 1 and 2. Diving into the DNA of this game is a bit of a mess, what with it having three directors and three producers, but the main names working on it are the Neo series director, Fumihiko Yasuda, the P5 Strikers director, Nobumichi Kumabe, and Square Enix's Daisuke Inoue. While Team Ninja did have a few duds over the years, mostly in the early to mid 2010s, Neo 1 and 2 are both legitimately fantastic games that are pretty universally praised. I mean, hell, I know a guy where whenever you ask him what his favorite Souls game is, without missing a beat, he says Neo 2. I don't know if I'd go that far, but Neo 2 is definitely in my top games of 2020. So, I had faith that Team Ninja at least knew what they were doing with this one. Fast forward a few months and a second demo came out, and yeah, things were greatly improved. The graphics were better, the game ran better, and the gameplay felt, honestly, pretty much exactly like Neo, which is a good thing, let me be clear. I'll throw a quick visual comparison up on the screen, but you can see how things were cleaned up. It still has a bit of that negative reputation from the first trailer, but even that seems to have softened leading up to the release. Everyone started off clowning on Chaos Man, but I think a lot of people have come around on him. I don't have a wizard orb or something I can use to aggregate every single opinion on the internet, so I did the next best thing. I made a YouTube poll. While not everyone's on board, a good percentage seemed to be willing to give this game a chance, at least a lot more than when it was first shown. But that was then, and this is now. Now, the game is out, and I finished it, so it's time for me to see if it's worth diving into the adventures of Jackie Boy over here. Since this is a hot new release, you don't gotta be worried. I'm not gonna spoil any major plot details here. Stranger of Paradise dropped on March 18th, 2022, but honestly, I have never seen a game that's given less of a shit about its own release date. If you bought the game, you just, no strings attached, got access to it three days early. And on top of that, they dropped a demo that was basically the first five hours of the game that you could carry over your progress from the week before. Definitely useful for your favorite D tier YouTuber trying to make a review video of the game in a timely fashion. It's me, I'm talking about me. Being a sort of reinterpreting of the events of Final Fantasy 1, similar to that game, its premise is pretty simple. First, you watch a cutscene of Garland Darth Vadering his way through a hallway carrying his new maiden on his back before getting into the game proper. The crystals have gone out, and the world is slowly dying at the hands of the four fiends and their master, Chaos. Jacko here has got no memories. He has no thoughts in his brain besides, I must kill Chaos. Chaos will Chaos. That's my He literally stumbles into his two other party members, Ash and Jed, says, Cool crystals, they fist bump, and now they're on their way. They meet with the king and he tells them about Lucan's prophecy about the four warriors of light and the crystals, and he gives them missions to prove themselves to save the kingdom. The whole intro kind of zooms right by, but it's pretty clear from the get go that something ain't quite right here. Things are off, and FF1's tropes aren't being played straight. The game takes a simple premise and expands on it later, but let's shelve that for now. 
Being a sort of successor to the Neo series, Stranger of Paradise is extremely gameplay focused, so let's talk about that for a bit. So, I think the first word that comes to mind when people think about Sopfo's gameplay is Souls-like, and I mean, you're kinda not wrong. We've got R1 and R2 is light and heavy attack, L1 is block, you've got a dodge roll, these crystal orbs are your bonfire, yeah, there's a reason the nickname Final Fantasy Souls is stuck. That said, I think this game is more of a Neo-like than a Souls-like, even though Neo is a Souls-like in itself, so it's kinda like a Souls-like of a Souls-like. Look, this stuff is complex, we don't got time for philosophy. The reason I make the specific distinction of Neo-like is because your game plan for this game and Neo are pretty similar. Enemies in Neo and Stranger of Paradise have poise, just like the player. You could focus on reducing the bad man's health to zero, but it's often much more effective to break their poise and hit them with a super damaging finishing attack. Wait. Does that mean Sekiro is a Neo-like? Bro. This usually takes the form of Jack performing a finishing animation where he turns the enemy to crystal and cracks him like an egg on the countertop. It's pretty satisfying to pull off, and it's cool how there's a unique animation for each enemy type. I especially like the one where he throws the cactuar up and it pops like a balloon. Your weapons and magic have a ton of different elements and attack types, so you're rewarded for finding enemy weaknesses and exploiting them, which will burn through their stagger gauge like butter. I can't really think of a way to talk about the gameplay as a whole without mentioning the job system, so I'll start with that. The main combat variety in this game comes with the different jobs you can assign to Jack and the other party members. Stranger of Paradise has eight different weapon types, one more than Neo 2 not counting ranged, and each weapon type is used by a number of the game's 28 classes. In addition to that, each job comes with its own unique skills and abilities. For example, Dragoons can use Jump, Mages can cast Magic, Thieves can steal enemy abilities. If you've played a job-based Final Fantasy before, like 3 or 5, you're probably pretty familiar with this stuff. You can also edit the different chain attacks your job uses. For example, for Black Mage, you can change R1, 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 R2 to a powerful earth damaging attack, and there's a lot of room for customization here. You level up these jobs individually in their job tree as you use them, and by advancing through it, you can unlock new skills, buffs, and eventually, advance the next jobs. The game does a really good job, pun intended, of pushing you out of your comfort zone and encouraging you to try a bunch of different jobs to max out their skill trees and unlock the new ones. If you really don't vibe with a certain job though, you earn items called anima shards from missions that you can use to level up your more neglected classes. For example, I physically cannot stop myself from wanting to be on the offensive, so I wasn't really vibing with the white mage class, but I wanted to use red mage, so I cashed in some crystals to unlock it. You might think that this leveling up job system is where the whole losing EXP on death thing comes in, but actually, this game doesn't have any of that. Experience you gain is permanent, and it's actually kind of weird to play a game like this where there's no penalty for dying. But yeah, the job system is one of the core pillars of the gameplay, and it brings a ton of variety overall, and all these jobs really do hit. I could really go on and on about this stuff, like how the samurai class has this rapid fire attack stance, and it's really cool to do combo finishers that'll put you directly into that stance, or like how the warrior can do big charge attacks that completely delete an enemy's stamina. But, uh, this video is probably already gonna be three times the length of your average hashtag big website review of the game, so just take my word for it. You have almost endless gameplay variety styles to mess around with here. And yeah, the gameplay itself is pretty heat. Neo is definitely more action-focused than the Soul series, and Stranger of Paradise is another level on top of that. One reason for this is that, unlike every other Souls derivative ever, attacking and sprinting don't cost any stamina. Now, your stamina won't recover if you're running the 100 meter dash while smashing the R1 button, but you're generally free to do that stuff as much as you please. What prevents you from non-stop slamming out your most powerful attacks is your mana gauge, which you'll use up whenever you throw out combo finishers or magic. Unlike stamina, mana will only recover if you attack enemies or successfully parry a hit, which is a mechanic we'll get into later, so while your stamina refills when you're on the defensive, your mana refills when you're on the offensive. This makes the gameplay faster paced, and in addition to that, there's a real focus on chaining combos together and knowing what moves cancel into each other. It's still more Neo than Ninja Gaiden, but the game makes a big point of letting you know which buttons to press to make hype shit happen. For example, you bring two jobs into battle with you that you can swap between at any time with a single button press. If you press the job switch button at the end of a combo finisher, Jack will switch jobs and dash forward and you can immediately follow up with the next jobs combo. You have a powered up state called Lightbringer mode which you can activate in the middle of a combo to cancel into another attack. Lastly, Jack is also a blue mage on the low and can absorb certain enemy abilities with the circle button. You can again use these abilities mid combo to cancel your current attack and go right into the next one. So sure, you could just do standard combos with R1 and R2 and get by just fine, but the real crazy stuff starts happening as you get better at the game and learn how to chain everything together. 
I'm gonna say, the number one thing I'm most passionate about in action games is defensive options. Man, it's hard to explain, I'm trying to think of a bad metaphor here, but seeing as you defend pretty much as often as you attack in this genre, good defensive options are an absolute necessity and are pretty often relatively neglected compared to offense. Stranger of Paradise gives you three options. The first is a dodge roll. Pretty standard, get out of the way of an attack, get a few iframes kind of deal. I mean, what doesn't hit you can't damage you after all. The second is a block, also pretty standard. Stick out your shield and take a bit of stamina damage whenever a hit connects. Skill does play into this though, as if you block an attack with perfect timing, your shield will glow blue and you'll negate the stamina loss. The last option, and oh boy am I rubbing my hands together for this one, is a soul shield on your circle button, which is kinda like a parry that'll negate an attack outright. Now don't get me wrong, you don't have to have perfect timing for this thing, but sticking it out will rip through your stamina bar faster than Jack rips through a conversation that doesn't involve chaos, so you at least gotta be a little careful. When your stamina drops to zero, you'll be staggered for a few seconds and probably will get stomped by whatever knocked you down, so it's a risk-reward sort of deal. That said, when you pull it off, it's just so satisfying. You get mana for a successful parry, there's a crack sound that's honestly music to my ears, and you'll deplete an enemy's stagger gauge, putting them that much closer to eating a finishing attack. Now if you're like me and your eyes go wide whenever you hear something that remotely sounds like a parry system in a game, you might wonder why you'd ever press the block button at all. I fell into this trap. My L1 button was collecting dust as I started exclusively subsisting off the dopamine hits I got from smashing the circle button. Well, like I said, this thing eats through your stamina gauge, so while it's great for completely negating a big enemy hit, multi-hitting small attacks are gonna leave you on your ass. Blocking is a lot more stamina efficient than you'd probably expect, so it's a real skill knowing when you should block versus when you should parry. You're not screwed if you mess it up, there's usually room to course correct or dash out of the way of the rest of the enemy's combo, but this system keeps you on your toes when you're on the defensive, and it's rad as hell. Now while I think the gameplay is overall really good, it does feel a bit less polished than Neo does. This obviously isn't a concrete measurable thing, but it just doesn't have that same tight feeling. I'd say it's like 80% of the way there. It's not busted or janky, don't get me wrong, but it could be better. Given how awkward the first demo felt, I wonder if this is the level of final polish they were aiming for, or if they had been constantly improving since then and this was the level they got to by release day. It would suck if it were the latter scenario. It's good gameplay, but I can feel in my hands that it's not perfect. That's my minor criticism though, small potatoes. My main criticism of the gameplay has been boiling in my brain for a long while, and if you've played Neo before, I have a feeling you already know where I'm going with this. Okay. I do not get who this loot system is meant to be for. I do not know who Team Ninja thinks is so addicted to the serotonin hit of finding new loot that every enemy needs to burst into a pile of multicolored rarity drops like a pinata. You just get way too many items, it's a constant flood of non-stop pickup notifications on the right side of your screen. You have an inventory limit of 500, and I maxed it out after just two main missions and two side missions. Quick aside, I don't know if they did this through a patch or something while I wasn't looking, but the inventory limit is 4,500 now. Once again, the fact you're reasonably expected to get this much shit is insane to me. You manage Jack and your other party member's equipment in this game, so if you're trying to do this stuff manually, you'd pretty much spend half the game in the equipment menu. You're rewarded for using equipment that corresponds with your current job through the affinity system, so there's a real emphasis on choosing your equipment carefully, but you just get so much, and so much of it is garbage. After seeing the optimize button at the bottom right of the equipment menu, I basically never looked back, and it sucks. The convenience is great, but I acknowledge I'm giving up a level of customization by using it. I just wish I didn't have to make that trade-off. Your equipment is the main way you get stronger in this game as well. Leveling up your job classes gets you new abilities and buffs, but your overall level is pretty much tied to your equipment. I'm pretty sure the game knows it floods you with garbage. There's an option in the menus to completely hide all items under a certain rarity, but the thing is, you sell your extra items for upgrade materials, so if you do that, you're kneecapping yourself. These are all just band-aid solutions that don't address the issue at its core. Finding a chest isn't, alright, maybe a new strong weapon. It's, ah yes, what filler will the randomly generated loot table dump on me today? Also, small nitpick, if you use the dismantle all option at the shop, it puts a check mark on your equipped items as well. I thought this meant it would dismantle those too, so I manually deselected them, but it turns out it doesn't. I'm glad the game knows not to dismantle the stuff you have equipped, but, uh, maybe don't put the check mark on them then? I shouldn't have needed to experiment with it. 
Look, I've tried to understand this loot system. I've tried to speak with people I know who are really into Neo. I've lurked threads about it. I get it might be useful for farming specific builds in New Game Plus. I just don't see it bringing any real positives to the table. Maybe I'm missing something, and if I am, let me know. But man, just looking at my inventory makes me tired. Does it ruin the game? No. Just like when I played Neo 1 and 2, I can ignore it and interact with it as little as possible. But it's been three games. This thing is begging for a rework. I'll keep the stuff about the bosses short, as it could get kind of spoilery, but I dig them for the most part. They aren't all winners, but I was having a good time with the majority of them. The bosses are a bit of a difficulty jump from the levels themselves, and you're probably gonna get smoked the first few times you fight them. They are, however, bosses that absolutely get way easier once you learn their attack tells and patterns, so you can feel your skills improving as you clown on them in the runback. Similar to the enemies, you're also heavily rewarded here for experimenting to find their weakness to bully them with it. Each boss also usually has weak points you can focus your attacks on that you can break for an advantage. For example, if you hammer fist the dragon zombie boss's head for long enough, he loses the ability to spit poison. It's also kinda easy to forget that this is a party-based game. You always have two teammates that can take some aggro for you if you need to back up for a sec. There's a dedicated go in button for each party member that you can smash to have them rapid fire off abilities, so you might as well make use of the assets you have. Definitely something to keep in mind if you're struggling on a particular boss. All in all, tough bosses, but satisfying as hell to take them out. Now, you've been looking at footage of this game this whole time. You can see that while Stranger Paradise doesn't exactly look bad, it does look pretty average visually. I'm fine with this. This is very much a 2.5a game, so I'm not demanding 4K ray tracing with real-time sweat rendering. There is absolutely a place for games like this in the overall gaming landscape. My point of comparison here, though, is, as usual, with Neo. Visually, I think there's a bit of a lack of polish when you put the two side by side. Neo 2 did have visual filters on its cutscenes that aren't present here, but character model quality, especially with the side characters, is pretty noticeably not great. Character animation is also kind of weird and stuttery in a few optional side scenes where you one-on-one -on -one talk to an NPC, and I'm not really sure why. I'll put some footage of this up in the background. It's hard to spot, but maybe you'll see what I mean. This doesn't happen often, but it happens enough to make me wonder what's going on. I said this before with the gameplay, but this is kind of feeling like a lack of polish sort of deal. I'm starting to double down on the hypothesis that maybe this game needed a bit more time in the oven than it wasn't getting. There's nothing to back this up at the current time of writing, just the kind of feeling that I'm getting. On the whole, it's not exactly unpolished and it doesn't feel rushed, but there are points that make me question. It's not the greatest looking game, but I'm seeing people say it looks like a PS3 game. Hell, I've even heard people say it looks like a PS2 game. I think y'all are forgetting what exactly games at the back end of the 7th generation looked like, and how 20 frames per second was basically the standard. This game eats those alive. Stranger of Paradise does also have performance issues though, which it really shouldn't on PS5. It's not a super common issue, but when there's a ton of stuff on the screen, sometimes it does drop below 60. Now that said, the level design is definitely at a below average level. It's very mid-2010s Souls-like level design. It's a series of hallways and arenas, you progress a bit, and then you kick down a ladder that opens a shortcut to the cube bonfire or something. That's not to say the levels are exclusively linear, some have winding passages and secret areas. These will usually contain things like chests or these lore spheres that give a bit of a hint as to what's going on with the plot, so you can put some stuff together in your head before the full picture is revealed. You choose the levels from the Final Fantasy 1 world map Neo style, and each level has side missions associated with it that usually have you going through it in a different direction or with different areas closed off. Once again, a la Neo. Now while the level design from a gameplay perspective isn't much to write home about, the levels themselves are pretty cool because they're all inspired by areas from previous Final Fantasy games. Yeah, it's Final Fantasy's 35th anniversary this year, and Stranger of Paradise includes elements from different games in the series like a low-key celebration game. The thing I like about the way Stranger of Paradise references areas from older Final Fantasy games is that it doesn't beat you over the head and go like, hey remember this? Start clapping player every time you enter a new area. It's subtle, and it's fun to think about what motifs are being used and what's being referenced. Even though the loading screen kind of makes it obvious which game the area is being taken from. But for example, the separate sub-areas of the levels have names that take reference to the games they come from, and the characters might mention something about the environment. Take this scene. This stage is inspired by Mount Gagazette from Final Fantasy X, a stage I'm assuming was chosen specifically for me, since I spent 45 minutes in my Final Fantasy XIII video speaking about it. When you enter the cave area called the Cavern of Blessed Trials, Sophia mentions the statues look like they're dreaming. Wonder what plot point that could be a reference to. 
It's not the most obscure reference, but it does involve you remembering a specific conversation from a specific area of Final Fantasy X. And I mean, in the level based on Final Fantasy VI, you drop the Warring Triad statues to open a path, which is pretty cool, even if it is, like, the worst level in the game. Quote me on that. Stranger of Paradise doesn't specifically go for the premier representative level from each game for cheap, easy recognition points. Instead, it works them in the other way around, choosing levels based on what fits with Final Fantasy I's world. Instead of looking at, say, Final Fantasy IX and going, okay, what level do we want to take from here and put into Stranger of Paradise? It's more like, okay, Stranger of Paradise needs a forest level. The evil forest from Final Fantasy IX is a forest level. Problem solved. What this means is, the levels don't just become a hodgepodge of Final Fantasy's greatest hits. The world still feels like FF1's world, just with elements from other games worked in. But believe me, when I say that these people were full willing to put other references in this game that not a single person was gonna understand. The trophy for beating your first Cactuar, No Escape, is a reference to, of all things, the Square Enix PS2 beat-em-up game, The Bouncer. Now that's a pull. The music isn't a straight remix of the original tracks as well, it's more reminiscent of it, I'd say. It kind of reminds you of the original level, but then you hear a certain part of it, like the sting or something, that's pretty much identical, and it all comes together. The original music here is great as well. I especially like this game's version of the prelude in the main theme. If I had to make a complaint about it, I'd say it's kind of lame that there's only one battle theme for regular encounters. I would have preferred a more dynamic music system, where maybe the stage theme changes to a more high energy version whenever you enter combat. One cool thing I did notice though is that characters will comment on how an encounter went when the enemies are cleared out. Like here, I ate a few too many hits I probably didn't need to, and Jet apologized for letting the team down. Jack is firmly in the camp that a W is a W though. And speaking of that, I want to talk about our boy Jack for a sec. People were making fun of him when he first dropped because it looked like his brain was going to explode if he went without mentioning chaos for 30 seconds. Chaos, 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 kill chaos. I mean, look at this scene where someone implies to him that there's a chance chaos might maybe not be real. Dude almost has a meltdown. Thus started chaos posting, which I think is unironically looped back around and done a 360 from roasting Jack to supporting him. Jack is so stupid, but man, I love him. He's voiced by Kenjiro Tsuda in Japanese, one of my favorite voice actors, who you might know as Genichiro from Sekido. Jack just does not care about anything unless it has to do with chaos. There's this one scene where this kid is upset because his dad was killed by monsters and the party comforts him. Neon turns to Jack and goes, say something reassuring, and Jack is like, I ain't little bitch, where's the mayor at? I need directions to chaos. You've definitely seen a bunch of clips already of just the absolute absurdity he brings to every situation, like this scene with the lich. <laughs> His solution to everything, and the finishing move on most bosses, is to just throw wrists at it. It does not matter what it is, it does not matter how big it is. Man in armor? Bare knuckle action. Giant boss creature? Jack will square up with it and box it out. He is an extremely unhinged angry man, and it's simultaneously entertaining and hilarious. There's this one scene where your party members are learning more stuff about their past, and one of them needs to air some stuff out to the group. Just the way Jack makes it clear he does not give a fuck about anything that doesn't start and end with chaos is incredible. Also, I think the party is kind of scared of him. They're talking about their pasts in the background during this dungeon, but they're like, dude, shh, Jack is gonna hear you, he's gonna get pissed. This game doesn't take itself deathly seriously. I think it knows Jack has absolute brain-dead energy, and I think it leans into it. A lot of people seem to be under the impression that the game unironically thinks Jack is a very cool mature protagonist that should be taken seriously due to this one quote from the producer, Jin Fujiwara, saying that it was unexpected the chaos meme became as big as it did. I'll throw it up on screen, but to me, it reads more like they weren't pleased on the hyper-focusing on the word chaos rather than Jack himself. Or, I could be wrong. I mean, at the end of the day, it is just how we choose to interpret a single quote after all. This is a quote from, like, mid-2021, so it's also possible that after seeing the reception, they decided to double down and lean into Jack's unique brand of cringe. I'm not saying he's a superbly written character and that the game is high art. I'm just saying that whenever he showed up on screen, I was having a good time. 
I've gotta be real though, while a lot of your opinion on Jack will probably come down to personal taste, if someone is like, no, this is objectively poor writing, a character that just has a one-track mind of exterminating his enemies is two-dimensional and should not exist, well, allow me to broadly gesture to Doom Eternal on the other side of the room. So, about the story, you may have heard from other reviews that the story is stupid. Stupid probably isn't the first adjective I'd go to to describe it, but it's kind of like, good stupid. Let's face facts here, the plot of this game isn't exactly a thought-provoking deep masterpiece. What it does have is this energy you don't really get from a lot of other places. I see people calling it the modern-day Metal Gear Rising, and while I don't think that comparison fits exactly, it definitely has that hype early 2010s Platinum Games kind of feeling. This game isn't trying to be a AAA Hollywood-style plot that you're meant to take extremely seriously. I mean, you wouldn't play something like Anarchy Reigns for that either. We're done here, Baron. Done? This motherfucker's not even medium rare! It's the dumbest shit, in a good way, and sometimes it's just extremely entertaining to watch what kind of dumbass energy the characters are going to bring into each scene. It's absolutely, unapologetically cringe. It's interesting at the very least to see Team Ninja's sort of alternate universe interpretation of Final Fantasy 1's plot and Garland's backstory. Final Fantasy 1 does have an unexpectedly complex story if you dive into it, but at the same time it was extremely story light. Sure there was time travel, but you pretty much had your introduction, a few text boxes telling you what the deal was, and then it was like, aight, crystals broke, you're the heroes, go fix them. Garland himself is pretty much the poster boy antagonist, but in the OG game, he has like seven lines of dialogue total. His story entry on the Final Fantasy wiki is only like, ten sentences long. There hasn't really been many other games that elaborate or build on Final Fantasy 1, other than stuff like Dissidia, and again, that isn't much. There's no all-important character legacy with Garland that has to be maintained at all costs or something here. The first Final Fantasy universe is basically a blank canvas. Like I said, it's pretty clear from the first hour or so that things aren't being played straight, and while it's not like life-changing revelations are happening, it's cool to slowly work out how they've taken the simple Four Warriors of Light trope and turned it on its head. I mean, the protagonists pretty much go through the same defeat the four fiends, restore the crystals of the elements journey, just the circumstances of the world and the conclusion they reach are extremely different. The pacing is… alright. It's kinda restricted since cutscenes pretty much exclusively happen pre and post mission, but there are some parts in the midpoint where it just kinda feels like you're going from one area to the next checking each crystal off a list. Huh. I guess it is pretty accurate to Final Fantasy 1 then. That said, the story really starts going in for the last 25% or so. Jack gets a full-ass character arc that's actually kinda well thought out. Him and his party members end up getting a real defined role in this universe. There's even something that's revealed about one of the side characters that made me go like, No. My boy. I legitimately think the game does a pretty good job tying into the first Final Fantasy. Both games exist side by side, and Stranger of Paradise doesn't invalidate or retcon anything from the original. Like, it really works, even though its canon is probably in question. Again, it's not high art, and the ending sequence is still pretty power cringe bonkers, but my expectations, despite not being high in the first place, were at least exceeded. It's definitely some knowledge I'm going to keep in my back pocket for my next playthrough of FF1 through the Pixel remasters or something. And that's it for Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin. Cultural reset, baby! First game to sell one trillion copies! There's some other stuff here, like a multiplayer mode where you use your equipment and join someone else's game as their party members, but that's pretty self-explanatory, so I don't need to explain it. I really like this game, but I do appreciate the fact it appeals a lot to the stuff I personally like in a game, which is for the most part, a solid combat system. Gameplay is really important to me, which is something you already probably figured out considering the gameplay sections of my videos are usually like, half the total runtime. It's definitely not a game for everyone, which is pretty obvious if you go to the comments section of any review site that's done a review of it. Like, man, I don't really argue with people online, so I forgot that's how bad it got. It's a war zone out there. If you liked Neo, then chances are pretty high that this is gonna tick those same boxes. I stand by what I said, this is the closest thing to Neo 3 until an actual Neo 3 drops. There's been like three demos of this game, and one is still available right now at the time of this video going out, so honestly, just go play it yourself and see if it does something for you. It took me about 20 hours to beat this game, but there's a ton of side and post-game content, and I'm currently working through my Chaos difficulty playthrough, so it'll probably keep me busy for a while. Might get the Platinum, who knows. Hope you liked this video, and as always, till next time.